Hello, and in this talk, I want to have a look at the problem of how to estimate the break frequencies of the poles and zeros in your response, given a plot of the response rather than an actual circuit diagram. We'll start with this one. It's a fairly simple case. It's a response with just one pole in it. So this would be the characteristic that we might get if our circuit had a voltage source there, a single resistor leading into a capacitor, and our output was the voltage across the capacitor. We've seen before that the frequency response of this circuit, h of omega, is 1 over 1 plus j omega over rc. It therefore has just a single pole, and we would expect the amplitude response, as plotted in the graph, to be horizontal at low frequencies, and then to head down at 20 dBs at high frequencies, and that's exactly what we see on this graph. Also, as we've seen before, the break frequency of the pole is where the low frequency asymptote and the high frequency asymptote meet. So in cases like this, the simplest way to do it is just put a ruler along the low frequency line, a ruler along the high frequency line, and where those two lines meet, that is the break frequency of the pole. The only slight problem would come if there are some other high frequency break frequencies as well. So the graph might look something like this, starts going down, but then maybe there's a zero and another pole and a zero at higher frequencies, and we no longer have a nice high frequency asymptote which is going at 20 dBs per decade. Now what do we do? Well, one way to proceed is to look at the 3 dB point. That's the point where the gain has dropped by 3 dB from its low frequency value. I've forgotten to label my axes again. Always label axes with units. Log of frequency in hertz. Now, if you're at the break frequency, then the response of the network is going to be something like this. The gain at low frequencies divided by 1 plus j omega divided by omega b. And if you're at the break frequency, then this is going to be omega b. Omega is going to be equal to omega b. In other words, we've got this. GDC over 1 plus j. If I look at the amplitude of this complex expression, that's just going to give me GDC over the square root of 2. That's the amplitude of this. Because 1 plus j on an argand diagram is right there, real part 1, imaginary part 1, amplitude, square root of 2. So in terms of the gain, the gain has decreased by a factor of 20 log 10 the gain at low frequencies, GDC, divided by the gain at the break frequency, GDC over root 2. That's just 20 log 10 of root 2. And as we've seen before, to a very good approximation, that's 3. So at this break frequency, the gain has decreased by a factor of 3 dB. So even if we do have some higher frequency breakpoints like this, we can determine quite accurately the break frequency of this lowest frequency pole by looking at where the amplitude response has dropped by 3 dB. And provided that 3 dB point here is a long way below the break frequencies of any other poles and zeros, that will give you an accurate estimate of the break frequency of that pole. You may remember that when we looked at op-amp bandwidths, we also derived the fact that the 10 dB bandwidth was three times the break frequency. So you could do it by looking at the frequency at which the gain has dropped by 10 dB from its low frequency value, and then divide that frequency by three. However, that requires any higher frequency poles and zeros to be even further away from the break frequency of your lowest pole. But what can we do about 
amplitude response is like this. The amplitude response never drops by 3 dB. It starts off at 0 dB, and a pole occurs somewhere around about here, which starts the amplitude response decreasing. But before it's had a chance to get to minus 3 dB, a 0 starts to come into play and pulls it back up again so that it carries on eventually level. So we can't look at the point where the low frequency and high frequency asymptote straight lines meet because they don't meet. And we can't look at the point where the amplitude response has dropped by 3 dB because it doesn't. So how can we proceed? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is slightly change my notation because I'm going to have to do some algebra to solve this one and life would be a lot easier if I can just make a slight change. And what I'm going to do is introduce Fz. That is the break frequency of the zero. And Fp is the break frequency of the pole. As we've seen before, the break frequency of the zero is the modulus of the zero. And since the zeros that we're working with are actually negative, the modulus of the zero is just going to be minus the zero. Similarly, the poles are actually negative, but the break frequency is the modulus of the pole, so the break frequency is going to be minus the pole. If the pole is at minus a kilohertz, then minus minus a kilohertz is one kilohertz. That's the modulus of minus one kilohertz. That allows me to write the overall amplitude response of this network in this form. 20 log of 10, I'm doing it in dBs, of the modulus of 1 plus Jf over Fz, that's the effect of the zero, minus 20 log 10 of the modulus of 1 plus Jf over Fp, that's the effect of the pole. And that comes from the general form of the amplitude response that we've seen earlier. Now, at very low frequencies, oops, I've forgotten a, a line there. At very low frequencies, this term here is going to be negligible compared to one. This will just be 20 times log of one. Log of one is zero, so this term is zero. Exactly the same thing happens with this term. So at low frequencies, we get that the gain in dBs is zero. At very high frequencies, we make the opposite assumption. The term f over fz, when f is very, very large, will be much greater in magnitude than one, so we can neglect the one. That gives us the gain in dB of 20 log 10 of the modulus of Jf over fz, that's just f over fz. And we make the same approximation with this term here, we can neglect the one, just take the modulus of Jf over fp, and that gives us 20 log 10 f over fp. Now, since the logarithm of x minus the logarithm of y is the logarithm of x over y, this just gives us 20 log 10 of fp over fz. But we know what this quantity is. We can read it from the graph. It's about minus 2.3 dB. So we can work out the ratio of the pole's break frequency to the zero's break frequency. Fp over Fz is 10 to the power of minus 2.3 over 20, which is about 0.767. Halfway there, we know the ratio of the break frequency of the pole to the break frequency of the zero. Next, we need to derive a very useful result about the product of the break frequency of the pole to the break frequency of the zero. And this comes from considering the case of being halfway down this slide. We know at the top of the slide, at low frequencies, the gain is 0 dB. We know at high frequencies, at the bottom of the slide, the gain is 
20 log 10 of fp over fz. So, the gain halfway down the slide is going to be 20 times a half of log 10 fp over fz. And I've written it like this because I'm going to use the fact that half of the logarithm of x is the logarithm of the square root of x. And write this as 20 log 10 of the square root of fp over fz. Now, at what frequency does this occur? Well, at any frequency, the gain is 20 log 10 modulus of 1 plus jf over fz minus 20 log 10, the effect of the pole, modulus 1 plus jf over fp. I'll write that a bit neater, it got a bit squashed. 20 log 10, also using the fact that log x minus log y is log x over y, we get this. Modulus of 1 plus jf over fz over modulus of 1 plus jf over fp. Halfway down, that's got to be equal to 20 log 10 square root of fp over fz. This means that square root of fp over fz is the modulus of 1 plus jf over fz over the modulus of 1 plus jf over fp. Now, the modulus of 1 plus jf over fz is the square root of 1 plus f over fz all squared. It's just Pythagoras again. That's just square root of 1 plus f over fz all squared. Similarly, for the denominator, it's the square root of 1 plus f over fp all squared. We can take the squares of both sides, multiply up by this term, we would just end up with fp times 1 plus f over fp squared is equal to fz times 1 plus f squared over fz squared. And therefore, that fp plus f squared over fp is equal to fz plus f squared over fz. Collect terms in f on one side, we would get f squared 1 over fp minus 1 over fz equals fz minus fp. If I multiply up the terms in here by fz times fp, I'll get f squared fz minus fp over fz fp equals fz minus fp. And that term and that term cancel out. That just leaves me with f squared equals fz times fp, or f is the square root of fz times fp. And that's the second result I need, because I can work out what this frequency is from the graph. That's just the frequency at which the gain is halfway down the slope. So in this case here, I've worked that out, and it's 14.3 kilohertz. So I now know that the square root of fz times fp is 14.3 kilohertz. And I know from my previous result that fp over fz is 0.767. So I know the product of my two break frequencies, and I know the ratio of my two break frequencies. And from then on, it's a fairly simple matter to work out what the break frequencies must be. Okay, next time we'll look at a few more interesting cases of poles and zeros.